All right, there we go. I guess we can start. Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript podcast on JavaScript news, and I just completely screwed that up, but whatever, let's get going. We actually have um, quite a lot of stuff today, so there, there's there been a lot of very cool articles this week, and uh, some releases, some demos, some libraries, and some cool silly stuff, uh, but uh, let's just get going and see what uh, great articles that is the majority of our today's uh, podcast we uh, can uh, read basically this week as usual you can find all the mentioned stuff on the github page under building x with js slash, uh, slash bxjs weekly the link is in the twitch channel description as well as the youtube video description if you are watching this on youtube so let's get started. The first article we have is called JS6 can do that. And it is essentially on um, its elaborate explanation of how JS6 works and how you can abuse it or use it in unusual ways as the author uh, says himself. So it all started with a tweet uh, from the author that looked like this. And <laughs> there was a lot of people complaining about it. It's like, yeah, what have you done? No XML again and all that kind of stuff. I I think it actually is very interesting. You can do that with JS6, but when you think, uh, I think it's just, you know, the way that people think about JS6 is that it's sort of a markup language, when in reality, it's actually just function calls. And uh, when you see the JSX like this, it's actually get translated to the function calls, like literal function calls, right? So if you are still kind of curious, or, you know, if you still don't understand how JSX works, and if you're still curious as to how exactly it functions under the hood, you want to understand it more, and you want to see how you can use it, for example, for mathematics, so there's like, you know, a square root from sum of two um, uh, power two variables, there you go, JSX way, I mean, Essentially, since it's a function calls, you can do whatever you want, right? So that's like, it's really interesting to see at those sort of approaches, because they are definitely not something you see every day. I don't know if you want to use that in production, but it's nonetheless a very good explanation of what JSX is, how it works, and how exactly you can use it. Okay, next thing we have is, um, I wouldn't call it an article, it's more of an introduction. It's called Glitch, a great platform for developers. So this is, as you can see here, a pretty big um, guide, I guess, or introduction to the Glitch platform. Uh, if you haven't heard about it now, uh, up until now, Glitch is a pretty cool uh, platform that apparently timed out for me. Uh, for a demo at least, that allows you to run uh, JavaScript code, both Node.js and client sites on their server. So it's like a sandbox, but not just for your client side code, like uh, code sandbox or JS bin or whatever, but also for the Node.js code. So you can actually write, uh, write the full Node application with a package JSON with Webpack and run it on their servers. Like in this case, it seems to be slightly broken. Um, I guess maybe Glitch having some issues. Uh, we, you can go to glitch.com and have a look there. And um, as you can see here, I already have some projects here. I used to play with it a lot, was like building a blockchain thing right on it, just to see, you know, to implement the blockchain ourselves and see how exactly it works. Was so like this, uh, using it to show the Fastify bugs and then BXGS proposal thing that I tried to build. You can use it for anything. Uh, it's, it works really well as a tool to showcase concepts, exactly showcase bugs, for example, and uh, sh uh, show other people how the code will work. For example, the blockchain example that I used, I written the simple JavaScript blockchain to show off to the other person how exactly it functions and that, you know, the concept of a blockchain is actually super simple. Um, this article goes into a pretty in-depth look into how the glitch works, what does it provide, what are the features, what are you gonna do with it, how you can share your work, how you can collaborate on projects, concept of remixing, which is essentially uh, similar to forking on GitHub, so you get the, you know, the code and uh, you can uh, do your own version of it, essentially. Um, GitHub import exports, you can have private projects if you want to, I believe this is a paid option, but, uh, you know, if, if you're using it so much and you need to do something privately, it's a great tool and, you know, by, by all means do support it. App URLs, you do get public app URLs uh, like this and yeah, whatever, just have a look at it. So it even has like secret support so you can actually use some private API keys that nobody else will see. Um, 
Okay, uh, that's basically it. If you're interested to have a look, in my opinion, Glitch is awesome and I use it for displaying node stuff all the time. I don't think there's actually any similar services that have a similarly nice interface and a nice snappiness. I mean, it obviously has some hiccups here and there, but that's not a major thing. Continuing, we got the next article called uh, Mixing Component Patterns uh, from Can See Dots uh, again. This is essentially, um, it's a silly one, right? So he just made a component that supports render props, component injection, compound components, provider pattern, and higher order components. All of that in one component. And there is a source code here with a bit of explanation and uh, obviously a link to the code sandbox. We're going to test it out yourself. And that's basically it. But um, I think it's a really good example of how you can mix those patterns and that they are actually able to work together. So um, if you never used any of them, or if you maybe use some but wanted to get into others, do have a look at this. It gives a pretty nice uh, look into what they are and how they work. There are as well some additional links here um, to learn more in depth about those patterns. All right, continuing, we got, oh uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the interesting things we have. So there's an article called, I use JavaScript, uh, the web for a day with JavaScript turned off. Um, and th essentially this is a think piece, right? So this is the experience of author and his uh, discussion on what he would do to improve the web without JavaScript, right? So he takes the websites, for example, a WordPress, creating a post without JavaScript and then doing the same with JavaScript. And then he gives his thoughts about um, what could you improve. And um, it's like, there are some interesting obviously thoughts. So I think you always should test for people who run without JavaScript because uh, like, okay, now I guess it's no, not a valid uh, problem anymore, but some time ago we had the Google bot that could not run JavaScript, right? So you had to optimize for that. Right now it's less of a problem, but there are still limitations, pretty heavy ones on uh, how long does it execute JavaScript and so on and so forth. So I would still go and do a server side rendering if you can, if you cannot, well, maybe you have to rethink your app architecture because you know, it's not that hard nowadays. Um, amazingly enough, it's like Amazon works almost completely like, okay, images are missing, but you know, it's not critical. And, uh, one funny thing that I want to show is that, as you might know, I typically run um, all my stuff with a uh, U-Matrix enabled. Uh, let me try that again. I typically run all my websites with a U-Matrix enabled that allows by default some stuff like uh, CDN JS and first party JavaScript, obviously, but does not allow any third party stuff like, you know, CloudFront hosted libraries uh, that are native to this site or like Netlify, whatever. And, um, What's interesting is that Smashing Magazine doesn't really work well without JavaScript um, disabled. So if I, uh, wait a second, did it just preload the whole images? Come on. Um, so basically, I guess now it has them cached, but before I enabled JavaScript, because it wasn't, so it looks like the image loading here is done via JavaScript. I wasn't able to actually see any images. And now, okay, now they work because they're in cache, but we can hard reload. No, we can't. Okay, he doesn't want to do it anymore, but. Yeah, so the funny thing is that actually this website doesn't really work well without JavaScript either. And um, author for whatever reason didn't review it. I guess, you know, it's not critical, but yeah. Uh, more, most of the time it works, like all of the sites work exactly as you expect it. I think the worst offender I've seen with regards to working without JavaScript is Squarespace. So if you go into any Squarespace um, powered website, you will actually see a blank page without third party JavaScript, right? So if you allow the first party on Squarespace, it works. And uh, if you, I don't know, is there like websites that they make it happen? Uh, yeah, there you go. There's a website hosted by Squarespace for Keanu Reeves. It's empty, right? There's like some stuff there, but there's like one script and one CSS file that is first party. Everything else is obviously Squarespace and uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, of course, if I allow like, for example, even JavaScript, I think it should start working, right? So that, that's, that's enough, but it is a bit iffy. So yeah, uh, definitely I would recommend to test your websites for the compatibility with um, JavaScript disabled, at least show something. I mean, you know, it's not that hard nowadays. Okay. Continuing, we got the capture and report JavaScript errors with window dot on error. 
a very simple tutorial essentially on how to handle unhandled errors in a browser. So Node has the similar event that you can uh, catch and also monitor for uncaught errors and uh, uncaught unhandled promises rejections and stuff like this. But in browser, you have this window on error. If you didn't know about that, this is a pretty nice tutorial that walks you through using it to actually uh, catch whatever the users might break when you're not watching essentially, and then sending this data to the server, for example, or logging it or what, what not, you know, pretty simple and straightforward article. Okay, next thing we have, again, this really, really big guides uh, that is called the guide to JavaScript regular expressions. So I personally never remember for the life of me any things about regular expressions and have to Google it almost every time because regexps are hard. Well, in my opinion. So um, having something like this is always nice. And this is probably going to live in my bookmarks for quite some time because there's a lot of really good uh, examples here. But uh, you know, if you're starting to work with regexps, this is a really good starting point. If you are already working them, you might want to have something like regex tester, like, you know, the regex 101. So there's like JavaScript flavored testing, and then you can actually um, test its stuff visually. So you can say, okay, once words until slash space plus question mark, there we go. Right. And you can actually get an explanation of what it looks like and so on and so forth. So this is like very helpful. All right, continuing, uh, we got NPM audits, identify and fix insecure dependencies. So um, NPM six was announced last month, right? I think I covered it in the last podcast. And it was released with the NPM audit thing, which was turned off, uh, because it wasn't finished yet. And now they actually released it, and it's turned on and you can actually use it in your project. And it I think it's automatically uh, executed when you uh, do npm install. So actually, after npm install, if you have any vulnerable dependencies, you will actually get message saying, Hey, you have some stuff that might be vulnerable. Do you want to check it? And if you run npm audit, you will actually get uh, something like this, that literally tells you, Hey, this is a package that is vulnerable. And this is how uh, risky it is. And this is what the problem is. And the coolest thing is that they are actually adding um, thing that I think is going to be up a bit next that will allow you to uh, or allow NPM to auto fix the problems, the security problems in your installation, which is amazing. I, it's like, this is one of the coolest features of NPM in the last years. Uh, I think the only thing I'm missing from it now is deterministic installs. I don't know if they've managed to do it finally in six or not, I probably should look it up. Because this makes me want to switch from yarn back to NPM. Like literally, this is amazing. All right, uh, next we got the article uh, called the best way to bind event handlers in react. Um, this is essentially a tutorial that shows uh, why you need bindings, how they work, and how you can do them, right. So the stupidest way is to bind them in render, obviously, but this is not going to work when you have a lot of components, right. So if you do it in loop, that means you create a new instance of a function every time that's not going to fly. So you can bind it in constructor, this is the old way. And I used to do that a lot, um, which is not so nice. But now that we have ES seven class properties, you can actually use arrow functions. And um, there's yeah, some additional things. So like factories for function generation, it also works quite nicely. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. that's a very nice tutorial. So if you want to know more in depth about that, if you never knew about those features do have a look at that uh, using Next.js or you know, um, create react native or no, sorry, create react app with Babel allows you to use arrow functions. And it's like it's might much nicer than binding everything yourself, basically. Okay, continuing, we got uh, yet another article on react context API, a replacement for redux which is, um, well, okay, let me first tell you what this article talks about. So the idea is very simple. The article talks about what is context API, they build the Redux app. So this is just a normal Redux app, and very basic one, albeit, you know, complete. And once they finish it, the author just takes the Redux and swaps it to react context, which is something you can do because you know, react context is a pretty powerful abstraction. 
The thing is that those are, in my opinion, Redux and React context are not mutually exclusive. They are tools for different things. So, you know, managing state with React context might not be the best thing ever. But this does give a good impression of what you can do with context and um, how you can use it, for example, to manage state, right? So yeah, uh, it's a decent tutorial. Um, some good thoughts in it. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in that, interested in knowing more about React Context API, if you haven't learned yet, that's a good starting point. All right, continuing. All right, this is something freaking exciting. So this is an article called Introducing Guest.js, a toolkit for enabling data-driven user experience on the web. This is a thing that was announced on Google I.O. I believe it is coming from Google guys themselves, although I might be mistaken here because I haven't researched the origin of it too much, but it is absolutely amazing. At least I know that it integrates with the Google services, so I'm guessing it is from the Google guys. So the idea is, is this is a um, essentially collection of yeah, libraries and tools that enable data-driven preloading of resources on the web. So they call it data-driven user experience on the web, but essentially it's a data-driven preloading of resources for within your app. The way it works is very simple. You set up Google Analytics and then you plug in the uh, guest Webpack plugin into your app with your Google Analytics ID. And what the app does after that is it will have a look at all the links that you have in your web page. It will take a look where the users click most. That's why you need the Google Analytics. And it will, um, using like machine learning techniques, right? It will predict what of those links are highly likely to get clicked and what resources need to be preloaded to make this nearly instantaneous. This this is just incredible. Like when you think about it for a second, this can save so much time, it's insane. Um, the cool thing is that something very similar already was available in Chrome, right? So the Chrome has this predictive preloading thing where you like search in Google, for example, it will auto preload the link that you're highly likely to click in, but it was like the browser level. And now you can actually have it application level, which is just, and, you know, it's, it's really simple. You literally just one Webpack plugin. That's, that's all you have to do. It works with Angular, works with React, with whatever you can imagine. And it seems to be very simple to set up. So I have not tried it myself yet. I uh, don't really have any projects to try on yet, but it does look incredible. And it even provides the lower level API if you want to, right? So there's like some really, really cool stuff going on. And I am um, quite excited for the machine learning future of the front end development, to be honest, after all that presentations. There's a bunch of links here on the examples and everything. Uh, you can check it out them yourself uh, if you think that this project might benefit you. All right. Um, next thing is a sort of short opinion piece called JavaScript is good actually. And uh, well, it basically talks about why JavaScript is good and why thinking that the JavaScript is bad in 2018 might be not a very good idea. <laughs> because I mean, come on, for real. Uh, it is a JavaScript podcast and I'm slightly biased, I guess, but I find JavaScript to be one of the better languages. Uh, it definitely has its quirks. It definitely has its problems and some things that, you know, from the old dark past branching to the modern age and uh, screwing some things up. But with uh, modern syntax, you have very nice code that is easy to read. With the tool chains, you get tools that allow you to be efficient and safe just about anything you write. The cool thing is that if, you know, we have all those amazing tools like Prettier, ESLint, Jest, Visual Studio Code, Flow, whatever you can imagine, TypeScript. If you would write JavaScript 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, um, that would be quite a different experience than now. So I tend to agree with the author, but you know, then again, I'm heavily biased over here that JavaScript is just incredible language. And uh, yeah, the community, so it gives a lot of props, for example, to Facebook guys and while I'm not a huge fan of the Facebook itself as the platform, I think the developers they have there, especially the JavaScript guys are just stellar. You know, the stuff they do is incredible. So huge props to the JavaScript community. Thank you for existing and doing all the awesome open source work. 
All right, continuing. We got um, talking about awesome JavaScript community. Uh, this is uh, just a gentle introduction to prepack part one from Dan Abramov, who is uh, working on a React team in Facebook. So <laughs> there you go. Another proof that we um, JavaScript ecosystem is freaking awesome and JavaScript community is amazing. So if you never heard about prepack, uh, it is a tool that allows you to pre-evaluate your codes and just insert the results right away when possible, right? So the uh, this is essentially a guide on how to use it, how it works, and um, you know what you can do with it essentially. So it starts very basic. For example, if you have a function that you know calculates the answer, this is normally would be executed in the browser, and this will give you an overhead, right? So what prepack does it just trims it down to hey, answer is four. I already done it for you, right? So this is the gist of what prepack does. Um, Obviously, the example is super simple. And for example, Google Closure Compiler does the same. It's not complicated, right? So it's a constant folding thing. It's been out there for ages. But prepack is able to execute arbitrary code, no just constant folding and some simple operations, which is where it shines, essentially, you know, it's yeah, so this is exactly the same very complicated example to add two plus two and prepack gives you four. Uh, while closure compiler would not be able to reason over that, right? And yeah, so this is essentially a very big tutorial. And uh, again, introduction, as the title says on what is prepack and how you might use it inside of your projects. So if you are looking to optimize for size and efficiency, and uh, maybe speed as well, then have a look at the prepack. It is a really nifty project. And you might learn, I mean, it's not exactly hard to apply, right? It's just, it's just a either a webpack or um, command line tool that does it for you. So have a look at it. Okay, continuing, we got a crash course on securing APIs with JSON web token. Uh, did I miss serverless word? I think I did. Serverless APIs with JSON web tokens. So um, it talks about serverless as a, some generic thing, right? But there is no generic serverless approach right now. We only have a bunch of different platforms like Amazon Lambda or AWS Lambda, I guess, Google Cloud Functions and so on and so forth. So this tutorial talks specifically about serverless framework, uh, which is an open source serverless uh, framework, I guess, yeah, platform, I would call it even. And uh, essentially, it is a tutorial on first how to work with serverless itself, if you never did it uh, with the AWS as a backend. And second, how to create an authentication based endpoints for it, right? So, um, or I guess, uh, endpoints with authentication, authentication based doesn't sound correct. It's a seems to be a pretty good tutorial on that stuff. So if you never work with it and are looking to get into the serverless functions, then uh, or I guess serverless functions is no, that's not right into serverless ecosystem, then have a look at that it seems to be pretty detailed from scratch to deployment to AWS, which is nice to testing and everything. So yeah, if you're looking to get into that stuff do have a read looks pretty good. Okay, continuing. We got uh, my struggle to learn React. Uh, again, uh, this is more of a think piece or opinion piece about the experience of one of the um, front end developers who have been working on front end for like 10 years. And he's not been doing too much JavaScript, but you know, mostly focused on HTML and CSS and he tried to learn React. By the way, want to note this on a website. This is just really cool. I think I need something like this on my website now. <laughs> This is just too much fun. Uh, but yeah, coming back to the article, um, he goes explaining like what was the gripes when learning it, what was the problems, you know, he had to learn ES6 because he never knew what it is. He never worked with any of the new syntax and all the syntax conventions. And this land, obviously, this is something that I think a lot of JavaScript developers struggle with until they understand how this works, how the prototypical inheritance works, you know, and stuff like this. And uh, yeah, so it's 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 a very interesting to read and see what kind of the pain points people have when they try to learn the new technology without having the complete background to understand it. Because you know, obviously for me it was a completely different experience because I've been working on JavaScript and front end specifically 
quite a lot. And in my case, I am terrible with HTML and C okay, I mean, terrible with HTML is probably not, but terrible with CSS. So I know I can use basic frameworks, I can make it look okay, but I am not CSS expert in any kind. But on the other hand, I know JavaScript really good. So jumping into React was quite easy for me, right? So but I imagine if there will be a new crazy fancy CSS framework with all the CSS features coming out, I would probably be lost in it just as this guy was lost in uh, React. So it's always um, interesting to kind of read about that. All right, continuing, we got a TensorFlow article here, real time human pose estimation in the browser with TensorFlow.js. So this is again from Google guys, Google Creative Lab specifically, the TensorFlow team. Um, very cool tutorial on how to use TensorFlow.js to estimate human pose. This is the result that you can see here, what you will be able to do with the codes in this article. It is a pretty lengthy article. I don't think I wanna go through all of it. Uh, I have not gone through it myself yet, but I am planning to reproduce all of that because that looks amazing. Plus I never worked with TensorFlow myself up until now. It's also really cool that I can actually detect all those people in the background which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And all that happening in the browser again. So if you are interested in applying machine learning and TensorFlow.js in the browser specifically, then have a look at this tutorial. It will get you going in no time. All right, continuing. We got an article called Design for Unanticipated User Behaviors. Um, this is not actually JavaScript, so it's more of a UX uh, article, but I think Anyone who works with the front ends should learn some UX at least, right? Because it is incredibly important from the very beginning to very end to build things that are user friendly. I mean, you know, I fail myself sometimes, quite a lot of times on that, but I try to be better. And articles like this are really cool source of um, information that you can basically pick up the small tips that help you build better UIs. So in this case, the author talks about a variety of UX things and um, using the real data while prototyping. Like the, yeah, the it, there's some really funny examples from like LinkedIn and Google Analytics Academy that they just don't anticipate that people would have such a long names or emails or occupations or whatever. You know, you just don't think it would be that long, but. What I learned over my time of programming is that never think that there won't be a long string because there always will be something that will screw your layout up. So <laughs> always try on the longest strings. Uh, yeah, internationalization is the other thing. So yeah, Germans and their very, very long um, words is a thing, obviously. That's also, by the way, the other thing about very long uh, sentences. Once you inter internationalize, there are some languages that tend to be quite that long. Uh, but yeah, in general, there's some really like nice notes on different things and it's definitely worth a read. All right, going further, we have an article, what's right with CSS in JS. Um, there's been, apparently there's been another Twitter drama about CSS and JS and there's like half of people who are not happy about it. The other half of people who are happy about it. And all of that resulted in this article, um, which, actually highlighted two interesting things for me. So first of all, that drama that I somehow missed, I'm not even sure what's it about. There's, yeah, there's this article, what's wrong with CSS and JS, and this is sort of rebuttal to it. And second thing is this Microsoft Fabric UI, um, which I never heard about before. So it is a React-based UI from Microsoft, or UI framework from Microsoft that allows you to kind of, make very nice looking Microsoft style UIs in, in React with CSS and JS, that looks amazing. Like, just look at that, that looks native. So like, if you are looking to build a Windows 10 app, which you can do in HTML5, by the way, you can just take this framework and you will look native on the platform within like seconds. And they even have like best practices here, like, holy crap. I've never heard about that thing before, I don't know why, because this looks absolutely amazing. So yeah, um, the article itself goes into rebuttal on you know why CSS and JS is basically good and covers the concerns that people typically, uh, typically have about it like portability or context switching and best practices. 
and essentially is a look into how the Fabric framework, the people behind the Fabric framework did it within that framework, which is also quite interesting to read about. All right, continuing, we got, uh, I mean, we're done with the major pieces. We got some smaller things here. So the first one being the working with STD out and STD in of a child process in OJS. Uh, again, this is a piece from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. Um, it is pretty short, but it's essentially just a quick example and tutorial, I guess, on how to handle child processes and how to handle their outputs. You can use, you know, streams, you can use promises, and there's a bunch of different approaches to this. So it all covers that quite nicely. And uh, yeah, if you ever needed to do that, have a look, there's some really good starting points. Right, the second one is, uh, again, piece from him. Uh, I think it's kind of an old-ish, but I believe this proposal was moved to stage three. I don't know if it's still in stage three. Maybe it's already even later, but it's anyway worth covering because it's a really nice uh, alternative to getting all matches with a regular expression, right? Because when you do it with a regular expression, you have to do this while loop and it's kind of annoying, right? And just having match all um, is way much cleaner and way much nicer to achieve this goal, right? So yeah, it basically explains how it works, how you can use it and how does it compare to all other methods. So if you haven't heard of it, have a look at it because stage three means it's gonna be in the language in no time, like probably next year, I guess. All right, uh, next thing we have is another proposal. So this has just been added um, to the TC committee. It is still stage zero, so a strawman proposal, which means it might not get into the standard. It might be just canceled at some point or changed completely. The idea is really simple. So we now have promise all, which waits for promises to finish, right? The problem with it is that one of the, if one of the promises gets rejected, then it all fails apart, right? So it will just throw and then you won't get the results. So promise all settles basically waits for all promises to finish whatever they do, be it a throw or be it a completion. It will just wait for them and then give you all the results, right? So it seems like a very reasonable thing to have. And uh, so far it looks like it's gonna make it into the standard. I mean, I don't think too major, like any major complaints about it. I don't know if there's any libraries that um, sort of interfere with the naming of the function. We're gonna see it once the proposal goes to stage one, I guess. But yeah, uh, anyway, it's just, you know, nice small thing that saves you a few lines of code that, you know, you have to catch the things yourself essentially. Yeah. Okay, continuing. Oh yeah, we got uh, pretty big news. So Firefox 60 came out this week, or I think last week, I don't remember. But we have it in, re yeah, this week, right? Because we have a podcast for this week, of course this week. Um, we'll talk about the release soon, but the thing is that uh, Firefox 60 includes ECMAScript modules enabled by default, which means that right now, native JavaScript modules are available in all major browsers out of the box. So including mobiles. So now you can use imports in all the browsers without worrying too much, right? So if, if unless person is on some ancient browser, it will work, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. Okay, next thing up, um, Jay Dalton, John Davis, uh, John David Dalton, uh, a guy behind the Lawdash and ESM module, is working with the Node guys to create um, named experts with live bindings that also supports import object from package based on the ESTD ESM package. So right now the problem is uh, if you expose stuff as a named expert, right? If you want to do import FS from FS, you cannot do that anymore. So if there's only named exports, you will be able to do only this, right? Which is not as convenient. And somehow using STDSM, he came up with a way to do both import FS from FS and using named exports, which is amazing. I, <laughs> I still don't understand why they didn't just merge ESM into Node because he had made a um, version of Node at some point that just had the uh, JS you know, ES6 modules support just with the package basically inserted into core and it seemed to be like quite straightforward. 
But I guess, you know, they have their own agenda and their own uh, thoughts about it. So I just don't know enough about the background. But anyway, that's a pretty cool stuff here. Okay. Yeah, next thing we have is Microsoft announced that they're gonna be adding support for JavaScript functions in Excel. So um, all of a sudden, the whole new market appears, you know, all those people who have been coding things in Excel using Visual Basic will probably be replaced by people writing JavaScript. Um, other angle that people often look at is, or I guess uh, view this thing with, is they're like, oh no, they added JavaScript to Excel, that's like more malware. Kind of true, but you know, we have JavaScript in the browser and nobody died yet. So I don't think that it's gonna be a huge problem from that perspective. Uh, plus, you know, Microsoft's Edge team, for example, have been amazing and delivering some really cool things over the past year, two years, I guess. So yeah, there's some exciting times in front of us. Okay, next thing we get is, um, you probably seen time travel debugging demo from uh, Edge guys, because the Chakra Core supports it for quite some time now, and you can time travel debug anything in there in Edge. The thing is that none other browser did that up until now. So this is a demo of React.js time travel debugging in Firefox DevTools. Um, the author, Jason Laster, says that it's still way off and will probably be released only next year. So, but still the fact that it is already in DevTools is amazing, which means that I really, really hope that Google guys will pick that up and add it to Chrome DevTools because I really would wanna see that. Because time travel debugging opens quite a lot of things that, I mean, simplify life miles ahead, essentially. It's probably a terrible metaphor, but whatever. All right, uh, next thing we have here is actually a video. Um, it is, I mean, it's quite short. I believe it's like five minutes or something. It's a comparison of Flexbox and CSS Grid, which is better or rather, when do you use CSS Grid and when do you use Flexbox and how they complement each other. So if you're still confused about those two, I was, for example, then this video gives a really cool explanation on both. All right, continuing. Uh, I think we're actually done with the article. So we got releases and libraries left. So let's do releases first. We got NPM version 601, uh, which adds finally, finally, you can control C during the installation without screwing things up, which tend to happen from time to time before. So you had to remove the log file, remove the folder and rerun the install completely, which was slightly annoying. I mean, it's not a major thing, but you know, so now you can actually just control C without thinking about that. Um, the audit, there's been some fixes to it because the people obviously found some bugs with it. Uh, and yeah, this other stuff is just minor improvements. It says here next zero, but I believe it's been released already. I might be, <clears throat> apologies, I might be wrong, but I think it's already live. Okay. Next thing we have is a node 10.1. So if you're living on the edge, you can grab it right now. Um, two major things. First of all, console table is now colored, which is always nice. And second of all, this is a breaking change. They moved fs slash promises to fs dot promises uh, due to some naming problems, I believe. There's a pretty long discussion actually in that pull request. So if you're interested, have a look. Um, yeah, there's some additional things going on here, which are not as interesting, I think. Um, but yeah, you know. Okay, uh, Firefox version 60, as I already said, with ESM modules enabled by default. Um, additionally, there is a quantum CSS engine that is now uh, enabled, I think. So it's, it's also been, you know, they built this quantum engine for Firefox for quite some time and has been uh, first replaced the JavaScript and now they replaced the CSS. So I'm really excited to see where that goes. There's also minor additional things and you know TLS and all that stuff, which is less interesting than uh, other things they already covered for us. But yeah, you know, if you're using Firefox, that's pretty cool. All right, um, this is also kind of a release, so I didn't know where to put it, so let's just put it on release. Um, Adios Mani announced new Lighthouse web performance audits and they've added quite a lot of things. So it now will complain when your JavaScript put up time is too high. It will now complain when you have multiple round trips to any origin. 
it will now tell you to replay gifs uh to tell you to replace gifs with videos and it will um yeah there's like a ton of improvements basically so you can just use the lighthouse audit to make your website 10 times better just by looking what it tells you to do you know it's always great again i18 was pretty amazing in my opinion for javascript world all right Continuing that again, not strictly JavaScript, but this is a tool that I use quite heavily. And I think maybe some of you do as well. Traffic guts release version 1.6 uh, major highlights are wildcard certificates. So you can actually get the star.domain.com now from uh, less encrypt because you know, they added support for it. Uh, you can um, now use open tracing and zipkin if you wish to there's a new fancy web UI and TLS certificates and Kubernetes secrets and access log filtering, which is actually quite nice for the GDPR thing. And uh, yeah, companies working in EU you can actually use skip drop or redact fields within the headers and logs if you don't want to keep anything. There's also this is one of my favorite things label homogenization. So before they had labels living uh, out separately from their configuration. So you could not use Docker labels to configure everything, which was a bit annoying. Now you can, which is kind of great. So yeah, traffic is moving forward and looking amazing. All right, next thing we have is the uh, XO version 0.21. Um, if you never used XO, it's sort of a combination of linter and uh, rules. So it's like linter with the preset rules, essentially with some small configs on top. Uh, essentially, it aims to be somewhat of a pre tier for linting, right? So it's based on ESLint, but it already has an installed config and all you have to do is just run it. There is some ways to configure it, but yeah, so it's a pretty nice tool and uh, the new version came out. So if you never heard about it and looking for something like this to have a look. All right, uh, whoops, that was not what I wanted to press. Um, yeah, I think we are done with the releases. So now we're coming to the libs and demo section. And the first thing we have, it's not exactly a lib and not exactly a demo. It's actually a manual. So it's a really, really detailed manual for passport JS, which explains you how exactly it works and uh, goes into all the detailed intricacies of it, which are for whatever reason, not explained in the official doc. So if you ever had problems with passport, have a look here, it has uh, does a really great job at explaining all the problems. All right, next thing we have is a UV ultra fast UTF-8 data validation. Um, it exactly, <laughs> it does exactly what you want, right? So just say, okay, validate it. And it just says if it's UTF-8 or not, that's it. That's all it does. So if you're looking for that, have a look, it seems to be very small, very fast, and uh, maybe do the job for you. Okay, next thing we have is a fast copy another fast thing today, a deep object copier that is apparently blazingly fast. And it even has some benchmarks here to support the claims. So I typically use Lawden, uh, Lawden, Lawdash dip clone, uh, clone dip, I'm screwing it up. But yeah, as you can see here, it is significantly faster, uh, almost like, yeah, 50% faster. So quite a lot. And uh, it would be interesting to compare it to the um, ES way of, you know, copying stuff. So like rest spread basically. Um, but yeah, still quite interesting. So if you're working, if you're, if, if this is your bottleneck, then do have a look at this library. Continuing, we got Yetch from Netflix, yet another fetch polyfill. Um, the trick here is that it supports a board controller, a board signal something that's been in discussion for ages. And this is actually a boardable fetch essentially, right? So you can say, okay, I'm started the request and at some point be like, um, now abort it, right? I don't want it anymore. Um, where does they actually say that you're gonna board it? It's a board controller, a board promise uh, to be sure to include them first. Um, abort. They don't, oh yeah, that was aborting. Aborting request. There we go. So you can say abort. There you go. Okay, so it's really straightforward. Uh, you just yeah, you pass in the controller. And the, I, I believe this was one of the abortable promise proposals submitted to a TC 39. Uh, but they basically implemented it with a fetch. Okay, continuing, we got a high store from developer, the guy behind Preact. again, another super tiny superficial library 200 byte key value store backed by navigation states. Um, 
exactly what you would expect. Very simple API, very straightforward. It's a key value store, what do you want? It is 200 bytes, so yeah. If you are looking for that, this is your choice. All right, continuing, we got a list, an immutable list with unmatched performance and comprehensive functional API. Again, performance claims, I don't know if they have any benchmarks. There's something I did not have time to check. Doesn't really seem so, but let's believe them for now. Oh, no, there are benchmarks, good. But the, uh, yeah, so it's just an immutable list. The API seems to be really straightforward. It has all that you might want from the lists, including filter map, reuse, slice, concat, whatever. You can generate lists from array and uh, convert them to array. And you can, it's basically because it's functional, you can use it with stuff like Ramda, right? So if you are looking for something like this, have a look at that, uh, written in TypeScript, by the way. So all the nice to have type safety. Okay, next thing we have is a cluster VS, a lightweight, fast and powerful framework for building scalable WebSocket applications in Node.js. Um, just as it says, you can just build a WebSocket app with a cluster capabilities, as you might have guessed from name. Uh, the interesting thing is it has clients in Java and uh, Swift, I imagine they were doing something with the mobile apps. So if you ever wanted to build a scalable WebSocket apps, this is probably the framework to look at. Again, written TypeScript, which is also pretty cool. All right, um, we have two more demos, I guess, and then some silly stuff and we're basically done. So the first thing is this CSS grid, grid.id or a grid, as you might have guessed. And this is a CSS grid creator. So you can actually just, you know, do things here and be like, okay, you know, I want this configured grids and grid gap is gonna be like 20, 40, it looks very nice. And then you can just get the source code for it. And you know, CSS, CSS grid is amazing, like literally. <laughs> so it's a pretty nice tool if you are too lazy to do the gridding yourself, right? Okay, next thing we have is uh, OniVim. Uh, it's a very interesting, um, where is my controls? No, please just let me do this. Okay, mute that. So the guys were like, okay, so we really like Vim and we really like the extensibility of the Atom and VS code because it's web-based. So they just took Vim backend and build a HTML5 or Electron frontend for it, right? You can, you can have plugins, you can have all the VS code and Electron and Atom bonuses with a full Vim backend and Vim shortcuts and everything. Which is, you know, if you're using Vim, you are probably gonna be pretty happy about it. If not like me, then well, yeah, it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> All right, we got some silly stuff here. Um, so this is the image from the Google IO again. This is the explanation of how their um, Google Assistant did the conversation with the people, right? So it actually had a proper conversation for booking the uh, table at restaurant, for example, which is pretty fantastic. But I found it really funny that they're like, okay, every time I see an image that depicts neural networks like this, I remember about deep learning slide that depicts it like this, <laughs> which is in my opinion, just too much spot on. It's like, yeah, okay, deep learning, deep neural networks. Hey, hey, yeah, um, it's great. And last thing we have is, um, New card and new tool from Syndrosaurus. Um, you can do NPX Syndrosaurus and you will get all his data, which is pretty cool. And his business card looks like this, which is slick as hell. I want one now as well. I probably should do something like this. This just looks awesome. Okay, um, that's actually it from my side. Unless you guys have any questions or any things you want to talk about, we can wrap it up here for today. Well, that is not where I want to go. Um, if you do have any questions, I will be happy to discuss. I think I just need some light here because it's becoming a bit too dark. Excuse me for a second. There we go, much better. So any questions? I will give you a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I'll see if I missed anything. I don't think we actually did. But uh, yeah, this has been like good 50 minutes of news today. That's pretty nice. All right. So let me have a look over here. Yeah. All right. Well, doesn't seem like we have any more 
there are any questions or anything. So I guess thank you guys for watching. Uh, hope you enjoyed the news this week and I uh, see you next week, hopefully on Friday. So I'm trying to get back into my normal schedule. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Still kind of traveling a bit around, but yeah. Thank you for watching and I see you next time. Bye.